I've got 12 minutes, and I'm going to about to start my 12 minutes now. Tick, tock, tick, tock. <laughs> Time's counting down. And we measure time empirically. I'm looking at a stopwatch here. 12, 13, 14 seconds. We break time down into measured periods of seconds, minutes, hours, days, and years. But also, we measure time subjectively. So I would say that you were young and I was old. But my dad's older than me. But I still feel older than you. And we use that as a means of creating a set of parameters which we judge our lives by. And we also use time to measure far greater periods. So one of the things that we've often done is use the clock as a means of dividing time up. It's a convenient source. We all look at our watches and we look at clocks. And there is a clock which we use which has been devised to indicate how long life has been living on Earth. So if you consider a 24-hour clock, and that is the period of time since the Earth was formed through to this point in time, then I can tell you that at 10.56 p.m. we got dinosaurs, and at 11.53 and 43 seconds we got humans. So we are quite late to the party when it comes to the history of our planet, even the history of life on our planet. One minute, 17 seconds before midnight. We haven't been here very long. We've done an enormous amount of damage. And as another means of measuring our potential for damage, we've got another clock. You might have heard of it. It's called the Doomsday Clock. Now, the Doomsday Clock works on a 12-hour cycle. And it was invented in 1947, because in the 1940s, we came up with atomic weapons. And a lot of people in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s were terrified by the threat of nuclear war. So in 1947, a group of scientists came up with the idea that they would have a doomsday clock, and this would indicate how close we are to a hypothetical global catastrophe. And at that point, it was nuclear war. And they said in 1947 that we were seven minutes from midnight before we would have a, a global catastrophe. Does anyone know where we are at the moment? How many minutes to midnight do you think we are at the moment? Two. So the people that monitor this, and they monitor it semi-scientifically, although it's a subjective measurement, say that we are now two minutes from midnight in a 12-hour cycle. And that's not down to nuclear war any longer. That's down to climate change. A very different thing. A much bigger, in a way, existential threat than nuclear war. <coughs> so you've got the whole of 12 hours, and we're two minutes away from a hypothetical catastrophe, which is quite terrifying, isn't it? So how do we get there? How do we get, into, how do we get from seven minutes in 1947 to two minutes in 2019? Um, well, it's my fault. It's, it's, it's my fault. Because I've, I've failed you. All of us old people have failed you. Because I can't stand here and tell you that when I was your age, I didn't know that we were facing a global catastrophe. I did know. I was watching it on a black and white television about the size of a sofa. Because I'm 58 years old. And when I was at school, younger than you, I was being told that the planet was heating up, that the ice caps were beginning to melt, um, that we were losing areas the size of whales in terms of our rainforest, that species were becoming extinct. But we, we haven't really done much to stop that at all. And as a consequence, I'm afraid to say that the world that our generations are handing over to yours is in a much worse state. Since 1970, 50% of the world's wildlife has disappeared. I like wildlife. Wildlife makes me get out of bed. I much prefer wildlife to humans. 
You know, I've got to tell you, I probably prefer wood lice to humans, to be quite honest with you. Worms, <coughs> centipedes, earwigs, doesn't have to be big and glamorous. What I like about all of those things is that when they work together in that complex thing that we call an ecosystem, it becomes harmonious, it becomes balanced, it becomes sustainable. There's an intrinsic beauty to it, a greater beauty than any one of those individual species. Yes, put a tiger on a pedestal, and it's a, an extraordinary organism. It's not doing anything. You can admire it in, in, in isolation, but really you need to see it in the context of playing a functional role in an ecosystem. Just one species on the planet that doesn't play a functional role in its ecosystems, and there's no prizes for guessing which one that is. It's us. Now, typically, when people like myself want to talk about the climate issue, or anything, we want to present to you um, informed judgment. And to make that informed judgment, we draw upon scientific research, because we are pretty good at that, even independent scientific research. So people like myself would go away and consult scientific papers, and we would come up with the best available knowledge, facts, truths, at this point in time. But today, do you know what? I'm not going to draw upon scientific papers. I'm, I'm going to draw upon a newspaper. Yeah, I'm going to draw upon the Daily Mirror from yesterday. It's a bit off kilter, isn't it? A tabloid newspaper published in the UK. Why would I want to talk to you about that? These sorts of things are normally full of Beckham and the Kardashians. But look, yesterday's Daily Mirror was an issue that was entirely given over to our climate crisis. What an extraordinary thing. A tabloid newspaper giving an entire issue over to thinking about, or getting people to think about, our climate crisis. And look at the cover here. Look, there's a photograph of a baby, Leighton. Leighton has just been born. He's younger than you. Um, and the headline is, Give me a world I can grow up in. And I turn on to page three here, and there's Leighton down in the bottom. There's a whole bunch of kids that have just been born all over the world. And uh, well, Leighton's dad, Anthony, 36, um, said, we are ruining the planet. When you see polar bears on melting ice with young ones, it's heartbreaking. I want the world to be healthy in 50 years' time. I'm worried that what we have now will be taken away. I don't have any children. And one of the reasons I don't have any children is I've been as terrified as Leighton's parents from the time that I ever could have even thought about having children. And one of the reasons for that is that I could never be assured that there was going to be a place fit for them to live. I have a stepdaughter, she's 24 years old. And frankly, I'm as terrified for her future as Leighton's parents are for his. And why is that? Well, I can tell you why. We can go to page 8 and 9 of yesterday's Daily Mirror. How the world became a map of misery in 2019. So let's just have a look at one of these. Australia. Over 4,000 square miles of New South Wales scorched by wildfires since September. 2018-19 was the hottest summer on record, which also contrasts with Alaska, other side of the planet. July was the hottest month ever recorded, the warmest mu March on, uh, on, on record. What we're seeing is all over the world, records are being broken, systems are being pushed, things are failing. And I don't need the Daily Mirror to point this out. You can go home, log on, tune in. Australia's on fire as we speak. California is on fire as we speak. Greenland is melting as we speak. And it's been melting for a long time, and we've done nothing about it. And why is that? Well, I'll tell you why it is. It's because our generation hasn't taken radical enough action to implement broad changes. I've got to tell you that although we failed you, we haven't been sleeping on our watch. Because we've come up with a remarkable arsenal of technologies, abilities, and ideas to solve all of these problems. 
we just haven't put them into practice because we've been too polite. We've been knocking on the politician's door. Excuse me. Um, got a bit of a problem out there. It's just that the uh, world's heating up. Um, most of the wildlife's disappearing. Um, it's melting. Um, oh, actually, now it's on fire. Um, so, oh, OK. That's right then. We'll, we'll, we'll come back later. Sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt. Got bigger things on your mind. Brexit. <laughs> I hate to say it, but we've messed up. We're handing over, as I've said at the outset, a world which is not as good because we couldn't change people's minds. And that's a difficult thing to do. Humans are really resilient. Once they've got their minds set, changing their mind is, is really difficult. We're all guilty of it. I still listen to punk rock music because punk rock broke in 1977 when I was 16. So I, I don't listen to the music that you listen to. It could be rich, rewarding, informative, enjoyable, but I don't listen to it. I'm stuck in my ways. I'm listening to The Clash, The Damned, and The Ramones. I'm guilty, like everyone else. But if we don't change our minds, we can't change the world, and we need to change the world. Now, I've got something in my pocket which is really dirty. I'm a bit embarrassed about showing it to you, to be quite honest with you. It's not a fox turd. Um, it's not pornography. It's this. Look, look at that. It's a single-use plastic bottle, and I've been drinking out of it. And all day, I've had that bottle, and I've been thinking, oh, God, look at that. What am I doing with that? Because I've changed my mind. Two years ago, I would have thought twice about buying one of these, and then buying another one, and then buying another one, and another one. But in the space of that time, we have managed to change our minds. And there'll be people in here today who think, I don't want one of those. I've got my own little water bottle. I fill it up from the tap, and it works for me. We can change our minds, and we can make a difference. And we can all do that as individuals. So how do you do it? Well, you can turn to the next page of the Daily Mirror because they're giving away 10,000 trees, 20,000 trees in pairs. You can plant a tree in your garden, in your park, or in your school. Now, that's not going to save the world, but that remarkable piece of natural technology will reduce pollution in that area. If you put it in the right place, it might reduce flooding. We have more trees than the north of England at the moment, up on the uplands. We wouldn't have had all that water in the lowlands, flooding those people's houses out. Trees are also great at carbon capture. They take CO2 and they turn it into wood, and they live quite a long time. So how long does a tree live, going back to time? Well, most of our oak trees will probably be lucky to live about 250 to 300 years. If you cut them in a certain way when they're young, they can go on to 650 years. The oldest tree in the UK is probably 5,000 years old, the Fortingale yew, 5,000 years. It takes you back to that clock, doesn't it, I told you about at the beginning. You know, when we try to think of a way of visualising how long there's been life on Earth, Try visualising 5,000 years, something that's been alive, which is alive now, that's been alive for 5,000 years, one tree. Like I said, plant a tree, you won't save the world, but you'll do something. And if we all did something, if we all changed our minds and did something, then we could make a difference. But we need bigger differences than planting trees and not using plastic bottles. And on that account, you need to do one other thing and it's something that the punk rock generation taught me. You can sit and be quiet like we have. Excuse me, is there any chance? Or you can bang on the door and make sure that these people who are not acting on your behalf urgently enough to allow you to inherit a world which will be sustainable for you to have a high quality of life, get the hell on and do something about it. You've got to. Shout above the noise. Use your voice. Raise that voice and demand a change of mind. Thank you.